Friends, neighbors, neighbors and friends, welcome back. Today I've got to track some drums. Uh, and uh, you may, may or may not know this, the, uh, the live room that I have at my home studio is my living room. So you're looking at the live room right now. Um, that being said, it's a very lovely sounding room. Uh, I've got some nice 10 foot ceilings in here. Uh, they've got a nice little slope on the ceiling there to, uh, to get some nice, uh, some nice, uh, you know, kind of a sort of psych wall orchestra shell kind of thing. Probably not, but works like that in my mind. Um, you can see that I've got couches and chairs and all kinds of stuff here because, uh, despite my best efforts, Gina doesn't let me keep the house as a recording studio, but I do get to decorate with some cool guitar amps and a, uh, an Ampeg cabinet back there. Um, got the Hi-Fi Center. Check that out. Hey, clickbait, right? Click the upper right hand corner of the screen for some, some clickbait up there. Uh, so I've got to move these couches out of the way. Um, and I know what you're thinking, man, you're, you're doing drums in your house. Yeah, I am. But I like to think that this is a professional studio in a home, not necessarily a home studio. So remove these couches out of the way. So in case you're wondering how I get connections out here, I do have a custom snake panel in my wall uh, disguised as a standard two gang electrical box. So there's uh, 16 channels of DB25 and there are also um, four RJ45s that uh, I can patch through a patch panel in the basement. So I'm gonna get some stuff moved around and uh, we'll check back in. So before we get started, I, I do wanna have just a bit of an organizational meeting with myself here um, and figure out what's uh, what we're gonna use. So. I am 99% sure that Ed, our drummer, is going to use one of my drum kits here. So um, uh, I haven't listened to the song yet, but I, it's a simple rock tune from what he tells me. So I think we're gonna use a Ringo kit, just a kick drum, snare drum, rack tom, floor tom, maybe two crash cymbals and a ride. I think that's probably all we'll need, but uh, let's get just a basic track sheet rocking uh, so we can just kind of figure out what we need to do before he gets here. So uh, we'll just, number a sheet here. All right, so I've got 16 analog lines in this room, so I just numbered this down to 16. Let's, uh, let's, let's pick some drums here. So, okay, we've got a kick, snare, tom one, tom two, we've got a hi-hat, we'll call this overhead hat overhead center, overhead ride. Uh, let's call this a crush mic. We'll put that over the kick drum, point it at the snare drum. Uh, let's do, uh, let's, let's get crazy, let's do an MS. So we'll do a mid side figure eight, we'll do a mid side omni. Uh, let's do a room hat, room, ride. All right, we'll do 14 as a talk back. Talk back and 15, 16 will be his uh, headphone amp. So we'll call that HP left, right. Okay, so as far as, as drum labeling goes, I like to use the hi-hat and the ride to dictate the position of the drum kit. Um, I'm not mixing this session, I'm just tracking it. So if you ambiguously label things overhead right, overhead left, um, I find that some people think about it as the drummer's perspective, some people think about it as the audience perspective. So I just like to uh, use the hi-hat and the ride for the right and left hand side of the drum kit. If you're looking at the drum kit, um, the hi-hat's on the right, the ride's on the left, that gives you basic, basic panning. Um, so I, another thing, you know, it depends on the session. Sometimes I like to get crazy, sometimes not. But I find that putting a bunch of mics on the kick drum, I end up basically just taking the kick drum and putting a little 808 under uh, sample underneath it anyway, which usually kind of gives me anything that like a FET 47 or a sub kick would give me. Um, same thing with the snare. I usually, I usually bump that with a sample anyway, so I, I'm, I'm kind of happy with just a, a singular snare mic. Um, because there's so many room mics on there, the, the spot mics on the snare, it, it doesn't really matter. And the only time I, I will say that I ever do mic the snare bottom is 
is if the drum is really deep. So uh, if Ed rolls in here with a deep snare drum, we may mic the bottom, but for, uh, for, the, for the time being, I'm assuming that he's using one of my snares and we're gonna, we're gonna keep that. So, um, so drum kit, so let's see, let's pick some mics here. So kick drum, let's do a D6. Snare drum, I think I have a beta 56 here. Let's use beta 56, why not? Uh, Tom 1, we'll use a 421. Tom 2, 421. Hi-hat, let's use, eh, I don't know, let's use an ATM 450. Uh, overhead hat, let's use an AKG 440. One uh, center, I've got this Aventone C12 that's like a $500 mic. And I haven't played with that in a while, so let's use that. Um, overhead ride, let's use a 441. Crush mic, let's use a Bayer M88, because why not? Uh, mid side, figure eight, we'll use a Audio Technica 4050. I'm just trying to think what I have here. Those are the only things that I have that have the multi pattern here. Uh, let's put shotguns on the hi hat and room. Or the that talk back. Actually, you know what? Let's use an SM7 as the crush mic, and we'll use an M88 as our talk back mic, and then this will be our lines for our headphones. All right, so I am going to get the furniture moved. Uh, this is our basic track sheet, and uh, we'll go from there. All righty, so living room is all set up. So I've got everything just sort of moved out of the way a little bit. Um, I'm going to further move this out of the way because, again, uh, Ed and I are going to have to go drum shopping in the basement and see what kit he wants to, to have. Um, I keep five drum kits here, um, just of varying sizes. So, for example, I've got kick drums ranging from 18 inches to 24 inches. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of toms and all that kind of stuff. So uh, at this point, I still have not listened to the track yet. Uh, so I'm going to go in there and do that now. But before we set the session up, I just want to show you guys the, uh, the mics. So uh, basically, I'm just going to move everything off to the side here. Um, and, you know, one of the things, I mean, I was, I was and still am a drummer. Um, one of the things that I always kind of hated when I was going into a studio session is, is when engineers had the session prepped, uh, the drum kit was set up and mics were on it. It never gave me a chance to tune the drums and it never really gave me a chance to set up the way I wanted to. So uh, that that's the New York session scene though, you know it's the, it, you don't have time to, to, to get into the to get into it. You just have to trust that the uh, the text uh, set the session up the way you liked it. So uh, anyway, just you know very standard stuff. There isn't anything out of the ordinary mic wise here. Um, just some interesting things. Uh, this is the headphone amp right here. Um, so I'm going to stick that under his hi-hat. I do have a music stand out for him. I don't know that he's going to need it, but again, when you're setting up, the last thing in the world you want to do is make a million trips in and out from the, uh, from the control room. Um, and I also have, let me see if you can see this, um, I also have a power strip down here uh, with two available outlets. So just in case he decides to bring an SPD or something like that, there's power for him. And then also if he just needs to charge his phone, uh, that's cool too. So uh, let's give the session a listen and uh, we'll get our session set up. All right, y'all. So we're in the control room. Um, if you notice on the console here, uh, I've got some music happening through 9 and 10. Um, I haven't used the snake in a minute, so I, I just got everything patched. And I just wanted to make sure that, that channels 1 through 8 and 9 through 16 are working all right. So what better way? You know, if you have test tones, why don't you just listen to some music here? Um, so here, I have to show you some, some dirty little things here. Um, so as far as the patch bay goes, I wired the patch bay here at the top so that all of my snake inputs are here and then everything cascades down um so i'm sure that the astute observers among you are saying god billy you've got a lot of stuff patched in there already well i originally planned to have the console so that um 25 through 48 are my inputs 
Um, and then uh, one through through 24 are my outputs. So when I'm tracking, um, when when the uh, when stuff is coming in, it comes in on the right hand side of the desk, and then when you hit playback, it comes in on the left. So uh, that's a, a pretty old school way of doing a split split 24 console. Um, the bad thing is the right hand side of my console is currently inoperable because that's where all my channels that I need swapped go. So I really only have 24 channels on the on the left hand side working at the moment while I'm recapping and working on the other side. So uh, all of this patching is basically taking our wall inputs um, 1 through 14 and then putting that down to our console inputs um, 1 through 14. And then from that point on um, everything is is normal. So uh, when something is inserted into this path here, it will automatically go to our uh, recording interface. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, so this this one to one patch is just because if you were to plug it in normally, channel one on the snake would show up on channel twenty five on the console, and I don't have channels there. So anyway, that's the uh, the rundown on the patch bay. Uh, I'm gonna patch some compressors and things in. Um, I'll I'll talk more about that once I once I get there. But for the for the time being, uh, that's the quick thing on the patch bay. And I also realize I don't have my interfaces on, so we'll get those on. Um, so as far as prep goes. Um, here's what I like to do, and shame on me, I have not zeroed the console out from its last session, but here's the first thing that I like to do. Um, Midas consoles have a built-in signal generator on them, so uh, that is this button right here. And then if you want to assign that signal that the signal generator is generating to anything on the desk, uh, you hit a little button called talk. So the way that the console is routed is the stereo output master module here has matrices on the top here. I have eight matrix outputs. So my matrix one, two output is what hits these speakers in the room. The master output hits my recorder. So if we're doing a down mix, um, uh, obviously, this all sums it down, and this is your, your left right out. So the first thing that I do like to do before each session is just listen to my outputs to make sure that they're balanced. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll engage my signal generator, and then I will hit talk on my master channel. Bring that up. And right now, I just have a 60 hertz test tone going through here. So what I'm looking at here are my output meters. So I'm, I'm looking at my output meters and I'm also using my ears. So if I bring my matrix up to unity here, I can take my speakers in and out and see what they want to do. And then I can also look at my rack here and see that I have signal on my system processor signal on my central station and then signal on the amplifier and also standing in the middle here using my ears it sounds relatively even so we can just take that out and then i can also listen to my output matrix and we're good there okay and then obviously we'll just pull up some music here and listen to that And that sounds good. We don't want to use uh, lose our YouTube copyright action. So now that this is done, let's uh, let's label up the console. Alrighty. So I've got my track sheet here. Let's get this labeled now. Should I be using console tape? Yes. Am I using console tape? No. I'm using spike tape because truth be told, I don't know where my roll of console tape is. It's probably in a Pelican case or a backpack or most likely strewn about this room that is currently a mess that I have to clean before Ed gets here. So looking at our track sheet, we are gonna do kick snare tom one 
Tom to hi hat. Overhead hat. Oops. Overhead center. Overhead ride. This is going to be our crush. And this is going to be MS figure eight. And this is going to be MS Omni. And we're going to call this room hat room ride 14 is going to be our talk back okay and actually speaking of that let's set up our channels 22 and 23 for daw this is going to be our returns we're going to set up 21. We're going to call that Billy. And that's going to be my mic in the control room. And that way we have 15 and 16 open on the console. Uh, as you can see, 17 and 18 are acting up. 20 has been acting up too. So I, in theory, have 15, 16, and 19 available should Ed bring any more toys in. So, kids, in case you're wondering what it's like to own an analog console, uh, that... You, random noise. There's nothing coming through those channels. Um, so the other thing is, let's set up our VCAs while we've got them before we assign any channels. So this console has 10 VCAs. Um, and when you're tracking, VCAs aren't necessarily, you know, uh, as, as needed as they are in terms of mixing, but it does allow you to break the drum kit up. So, you know, in the control room, I don't really care so much about room mics and things like that. Um, I just want to hear the kick and the snare, uh, the close mic. So I'm going to set this up, uh, just to break the drum kit out over my VCAs. So, uh, Number one, I'll call that kick snare because I usually set up my VCA as that. Uh, we'll call this VCA two toms. Uh, VCA three, we'll call this overhead. VCA four, we'll call that room. And then if we want to assign anything else along the way, we can. So to assign your VCA on this gorgeous Midas analog, Heritage 2000, what you have to do is unlock your master section, hit your VCA assign, and let's start with VCA1. So we go to our assign key, we're going to hit that, and we're going to say our kick and our snare are going to go to VCA1, which those two lights are illuminated, and they are. We will deselect that, select VCA2. We're going to put our toms in there. Okay, VCA3, we're going to call that overheads. So we're going to call it hi-hat, overhead, overhead, overhead. Uh, let's throw the crush mic in that VCA, and then we'll put our rooms into... Actually, I lied. I'm putting the, the crush mic into VCA1, so that, that can go with the kick and the snare. And then our rooms are going to go into VCA4. Okay, Talkback is not in a VCA. DAW is not in a VCA. Although, you know what? I'm going to put the DAW in VCA10. I'm also going to throw the Sharpie across the room. Because we have a stereo channel. And instead of grabbing both faders, I can just grab a VCA. So, go down to VCA10. 23, 24 is in VCA 10. We'll go back to lock. And that way, and then we can make these lights go away. So just like a digital console, this, this analog console also has a spill feature. So if you hit the VCA button, it will light up the console, which I'm sure you probably can't see because I have the room lights on, but you know, VCA 1, 2, 3, back to VCA 1, VCA 4, and this takes us down to VCA 10. And that way, too, if you're if you're troubleshooting something and you look on this other side of the desk uh, and you're like, oh, my God, why is something coming through? You can look at that. So uh, just as a uh, to get this started, we're going to put all of our VCAs up to Unity so that we don't forget. And that deck technically doesn't matter because our channel faders will be down. So uh, let's look at our track sheet. Um, so, 
I don't have a ton of analog um, outboard gear at the moment, but I do have a, a couple of pieces. So I'm just gonna assign these channels to my stereo output because I am not using groups for this tracking session. So let's see, let's see what we wanna use here. Uh, on the analog rack of doom, I've got a DBX 160 SL. I'm gonna use that for my overheads. Uh, and then down here in 500 land, I've got two DBX 560As. Um, I am gonna use that on the kick and the snare. Uh, one of the Midas 522 compressors, I'm gonna use that as my crush. Um, and then I'm gonna use my other 522 as uh, Ed's talkback mic because, hey, the 80s happened and that's how you get that cool room. Uh, one of the other things that I'm gonna do on this particular session is I do have a um, subharmonic synthesizer that I'm gonna patch in on the crush mic just to get a little bit more low end because we're putting that right over the kick. Um, and I found my Sonic Maximizer in a rack, and I've owned this thing since like 2005, and it's the good one with XLRs on the back, not the crappy one with quarter inches. So let's get crazy and put this thing on the toms. I've been dying to play with it, so I'm gonna patch that in as an insert on the toms. Let, if it if it's cool, we'll use it. If it's not, we won't. So uh, let's let's go ahead and patch here. So uh, taking our track sheet down here. We are going to patch first the kick drum compressor. So we're gonna take our 560 and we are gonna patch that into insert one, send and receive. All right, and then I am gonna take a little piece of some tape left over from a previous session. And I'm just gonna label our insert rack here so that in the heat of battle, if you're trying to remember what stuff does, you know. So one of the things that I always like to impress upon people when doing this is that when this, take as much time during the calm before the storm right now to make sure that everything is patched, everything works, and everything is labeled. Because you never know what's gonna happen. I'll call this crush. I'll call this TB. You never know what's gonna happen once the band gets here. Because think about it like this. They're nervous. You're sorta of nervous, no matter how many times you do this, about what's gonna happen, what's gonna, what's gonna fail. A, a bunch of people are gonna ask you a million questions all at once, and you have to be ready for that. So taking time to just label things uh, in, in the calm before a session is absolutely invaluable. That goes for recording that goes for any live situation as well so if you watched my live videos which i would assume that you probably do because you're billy super fans right i'll pause for laughter because of course you're not um oh it's our crush mic our crush mic is channel nine all right so channel nine is we're gonna start our insert path here so we're gonna go Channel 9 send, we're gonna put that into our subharmonic synth. We're gonna take the output of our subharmonic synth, put that into our Midas 522 compressor, take the output of the Midas 522 compressor, and put this into the return of channel nine. So for those of you who are not familiar with outboard gear, this works just like inserts in Pro Tools or Logic. So I decided what I wanted to be first my subharmonic synth, I wanted that to be first. I wanted to take the output of the, of the subharmonic synth and compress that, so I put my, my compressor next in the chain. Uh, if you're looking at what you think inserts look like on, an, on, a, on a DAW, this is where it comes from. So let's patch our, ooh, I didn't patch our, sub, our um, 
uh, Tom's in. Uh, three and four, a Sonic Maximizer. Okay, so three is Tom one. Put that in there. I don't know if this Sonic Maximizer is cool or not. I, uh, <laughs> let's, let's see. Let's see what it does. I, I think it could be cool. They, back in the 90s, when these things came out, it was uh, all of the rage to put these on toms. And I've never used this thing in that situation. I've always just had it in like DJ racks because that's what you did at that time. Um, I know that famously Big Mick from Metallica used that across his toms, which is of course why I bought it. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's patch our 160 into our overheads. Actually, you know what? I lied. I want to do that on room. So let's put rooms... Uh, okay, that's 12 and 13. So 12. We're going to patch that into our 160. Left. And then right. Yikes. Almost out of patch cables here. Okay. So if you're, if any of you have used a Midas Pro Series console, uh, the routing was always infuriating to me um, because it follows this analog world. You have to. There's not just a little box like. Uh, there's not just a little box like uh, like Avid consoles. I always kind of thought that was funny. It, it took me a minute when I first started getting on those consoles. They're like, yeah, it's supposed to look like an analog console. It's like, but it's digital. Why would you do that? And just in case you're wondering, this is me talking like a crazy person alone in my house with a GoPro strapped on, strapped on my head. So hope you guys are enjoying this. Okay, so I'm just going to label this. Put that there. Room left if i was mixing the session i would put a little i would print some spx but i'm not so i'm gonna keep it conservative so just to make sure that things work let's engage our inserts here kick has an insert snare has an insert tom one has an insert tom two has an insert right oh and actually i should patch i should write this on my track sheet so that if and when things go awry, we have 560, 560. We'll call this Sonic 1, Sonic 2. Uh, crush is uh, subharmonic to 522. Talkback is 522. Room right, room left is 160 left, 160 right. So just in case, God forbid, we're not going to have any patch issues on this session, right? You guys are all with me. All right, so we're up to channel four. When's our next one? Channel nine. Okay, we've got our insert engaged on channel nine. Channel 12 and 13, we're also going to engage our insert. And channel 14, we're going to engage our insert. Lovely. Great. All righty. So uh, we've got our tracks organized. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> the tracks were not labeled. So I need to listen to that and label these. So guys, as a favor, for if somebody else is mixing your session, please label the tracks that you're exporting. That would be lovely. Um, so what I am going to do is now we have to assign all our outputs. So I'm mixing Innuendo today, or tracking Innuendo. I have outputs one and two assigned. I can see that on my 24AO, I am seeing outputs one and two. So we need to patch these into channels 22 and 23 on the console. So let's just give those a mute. And we are saying interface output one, two. We're gonna go here. 
Check these out. One, two. Okay, I'm gonna need a longer patch cable. Grab these guys. So let's see. Interface out. One is going to go to console in. 22. Interface out. Two is going to go to console in. 23. All right, so that is cool. Our our DAW return is set up, and hey, look, somebody set that up on a VCA. I wonder who did that. It was me. It was me. Okay, so we're gonna get these other tracks assigned here, and I will report back. All right, everybody. So we've got the session up. We've got everything assigned here in Nuendo. Um, the only thing that I haven't done yet is just make a, a, a final marker track. Um, they didn't submit a tempo, um, so I'm having a hard time getting the click lined up. So uh, I don't want to make markers for uh, song form. So generally what I'll do is just, you know, do verse, chorus, pre-chorus, that kind of thing. So if we have to make any punches or anything like that, you know, I know where the song form is and you don't have to just read uh, waveforms. But anyway, session is set up. The only thing that I didn't show you was setting up my talkback mic, uh, which is just a, um, a patch here on my local I.O. Uh, the monitor card in the, uh, in the console is pretty dirty, so um, I'm just going to use the talkback mic into a channel. So anyway, uh, that concludes this part of the video. Uh, stay tuned for part two when Ed gets here and we set up his drums and tune them and mic them and all that all that kind of stuff. So anyway, thanks for watching. Really appreciate y'all stopping by. We'll catch you on the next one.